Hi, my name is Chris Mancuso, and I'm a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Arjun Krishnan at Michigan State University. Um, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about some work that we recently published in bioinformatics, and that was supported by NIH grants. Um, so genes can participate in many different pathways, processes, diseases, and traits. Um, the sheer number of the roles that genes can play make it um, incredibly challenging to experimentally determine these things on a timely, uh, in a timely fashion. Um, so it's a grand challenge at bioinformatics to be able to, do, um, to annotate genes to their roles computationally. Um, so a uh, classic way of doing this is say you have a gene annotated to a given function, you can find and you have a new gene, you want to, you can take the sequence similarities and if they're similar enough, you can say they may maybe perform the same function. However, it's been shown that um, uh, genes uh, behave differently in different um, biological contexts. And one way of being able to kind of capture this um, context specific interactions is through the use of molecular networks. So this work, what we have done is, um, we have shown that a supervised machine learning model where you use the network connections as features um, outperforms uh, the state-of-the-art uh, uh, method of label propagation for the task of network-based gene classification. So the computational pipeline that we have um, is first we start with a molecular network and then we can either represent that uh, as an adjacency matrix, which we refer to as A, where the, the connections are just the connections we get directly from the network, or we can create an influence matrix where we diffuse the information of the edges using a random start with three walk kernel. Um, and we refer to this matrix as I. Now we can put the, the um, basically the rows of these matrix now become the examples of a machine learning algorithm where genes can be positively or negatively labeled for a given function or trait or disease. And the columns are the network connections um, for those genes. Uh, and similar, we can just directly use those networks um, in label propagation. Uh, we evaluate over a number of different uh, networks. Um, we use different classification tasks. For instance, GoBP is a gene set collection um, that contains, um, you know, biological processes or functions of genes. DisGeneNet is a, a, a gene set collection of, of diseases where each, you know, gene set is a, is a specific disease with the genes annotated to it. Uh, so our, some of our validation schemes is temporal holdout is the training is the oldest genes and the, what we evaluate on are the newer, the newerly, the newest annotated genes. And study bias holdout is we, we train with the most well studied on genes and then we try to predict the less studied genes, um, try to mimic predicting novel associations. Um, uh, the supervised learning method that we use in this uh, work is logistic regression with L2 regularization. So one of the things that we tried to do is um, uh, we did a rank-based comparison. So for each gene set in a gene set collection, we can evaluate each of the four models on a given gene set. And then we can rank their performance relative to each other. Then we can look over across all gene sets in that gene set collection and kind of come up with an average rank for that method. Um, and so the lower the rank, the better. So the higher on the y-axis here, the better. And what can be seen is that supervised learning outperforms labor propagation. And in particular, um, the, um, uh, for fu function prediction. So we also wanted to do this statistically. So what we do is um, we take um, a, you know, the evaluations for all gene sets in a gene set collection, and then we, can put, we do that for um, a SL model versus an L, uh, LP model. And then what we do is we compare them using the Wilcox and rank sum test. And then we also keep track of how many times one method was better than the other for each of the gene sets. Um, and so what we can see here is that the more red is that SL is performing better um, you know, a certain percentage of times. And we also see that this over, that this better performance is also statistically significant. Um, so any cell that's annotated with um, the method is that that method was statistically significantly better according to the Wilcoxon test. Um, so the box plots comparisons here, this is mostly just to show, give an idea of the absolute performance on all tasks. Uh, and panel B just shows that, you know, function prediction in general is just easier than disease trait prediction. So we also evaluated um, our methods on using uh, node embedding. So instead of using the full network connections as uh, the features, so typically in SLA or SLI, you'll have you know, 20 to 30,000 
columns or features. So SLE allows you to take a network and then embed it to a lower dimension, a dimensional space. So now we have a, a network that's still, you know, 20 to 1,000, 20 to 30,000 rows where you represent all the genes there still, but now the columns are around 200. Um, so when we used uh, note to vec to do this embedding, um, and so what we see is that that SLE um, kind of does outperform uh, label propagation as well, um, and it's significant most of the time. However, when you compare SLE to SLA, um, you uh, see that SLA still wins. So it's kind of, uh, you know, embeddings are really good and they kind of beat label propagation, but they're still not quite as good as using the full network connection. So um, you know, some a little bit more work it has to go into, you know, in designing um, embeddings um, to increase this performance. Uh, one last thing is uh, what is the, um, how well, you know, would a method like supervised learning utilize the network? It's kind of easy to see in label propagation because it just takes information directly from the neighbors. Um, however, in SL, it's kind of unclear to Steve. So what we did is we looked at a non-network uh, non based property, which is the number of genes, and we see no correlation in SLA or LPI. But if we look at like the edge density of the genes uh, in a given gene set and this or the segregation where the segregation is the isolation of that gene set from the rest of the network, we can see that SLA um, captures the network properties just as well as LPI. Um, so that's it. Um, so again, this work has been published in bioinformatics and I encourage um, everyone to go uh, look at the paper and we also have the code publicly available um, to reproduce all these um, plots and stuff as well. Um, so and that the information for that is in the publication. Thank you.